law is a complex topic. To provide more analysis of these changes, we're joined by Monsignor William King, Canon Law Professor at Mount St. Mary's Seminary, and Sister Nancy Bauer, Associate Professor of the School of Canon Law at the Catholic University of America. Thank you both for helping explain this important matter. Monsignor King, let's get started with you. Can you give us some history? When was canon law developed and why? Oh my, well, we have examples of it uh, from the Acts of the Apostles when uh, the apostles encountered new questions, new cultures, questions of how to do things. Perhaps uh, the first canon law came from Jesus in uh, saying, if you have uh, questions, bring together uh, some uh, members of the church, discuss it, and uh, the first legislation of the church truly is found in the Council of Jerusalem. When St. Paul went back and talked with St. Peter and St. James and the other apostles about how to spread the church and what the disciplinary norms would be uh, in new areas of the church. And we have a lot of history of that. Sister Bauer, these revisions include specifics for those in consecrated and apostolic life. Yes. Can you explain a little bit more? The the whole issue of sexual abuse of minors was not the religious inst lay religious institutes, uh, particularly the women's religious institutes, were not really part of all of that particular law that was being drafted, were not part of the essential norms. It wasn't until uh, Vos Estes a few years ago that women religious were brought into this whole realm of uh, canon law of how to respond to allegations, for example, against a sister. So we're talking about religious, women's religious institutes, other lay religious institutes. There are, are about 33 religious institutes that are lay men rather than clerical, uh, secular institutes, and societies of apostolic life. So it wasn't until Vos Estes that the women religious were brought into this and the requirement to report and all of the things about superiors uh, handling these allegations. So women religious are just revising their policies. Uh, I was just on a committee of three Benedictines. We revised or we drafted policies for protection of minors and protection of vulnerable adults, that hopefully these policies can be used by the Benedictine monasteries of sisters around the country. So it's a new phase for women, <laughs> and uh, also uh, women who would be in secular institutes, societies of apostolic life. So affecting both women religious and lay, lay women and apostolates. That's, that's good to hear. Monsignor King, before we talk about reporting of crimes, can you explain a little bit more about the, the penalties here? There are two types of penalties in the church, but I think we should remember that the application of penalties is considered by the church to be a last resort. The best approach is always to create a climate or a structure in which the commission of a crime is to be avoided. But when that can't be, then there are two types of penalties. Uh, one is called a medicinal penalty. The other is called an expiatory penalty. A medicinal penalty has the purpose of medicine. It's meant to cure the offender. And uh, so it's a, usually a temporary uh, penalty. The other, expiatory, is meant to uh, expiate for the, the crime that's done, and it can be a permanent penalty for very serious offenses. And so then what are the systems for reporting these crimes? Can you break that down for us? Certainly. One of the things that's new in these revisions is eliminating a bit of discretion from the uh, ecclesiastical authorities, such as bishops or religious superiors. I in the past, uh, there was a bit of discretion as to whether a process uh, should begin. This set of uh, changes makes it clear that uh, a process must be begun when an offense is reported that, that is serious in nature. And uh, normally that's done by bringing it to the attention of a diocesan bishop or a religious superior, and then uh, the procedure follows from there. Sister Bauer, once we go through this process that Monsignor King describes, these new laws can lead to excommunications and defrocking. What does that mean? 
Well, let me say, uh, back up a little bit, there are, even before these new canons, in the canons on religious institutes, there is the possibility of dismissal from religious life, from your religious institute, uh, for uh, violations against the Sixth Commandment, including there was already in there the provision that someone who committed sexual abuse of a minor was supposed to be, uh, there was what's called a mandatory dismissal, but it, but it was, there was a possibility of choosing not to dismiss for that particular delict. So there's, there's not only for religious the possibility of being dismissed from your religious institute, that was already in the code, but now it's also uh, the delict for which other penalties can be applied. And the penalties that are listed for religious, it says, are, um, could be, for example, uh, paying a fine. Now there's a difficulty there because religious have made a vow of poverty. Uh, but it's also applied to laypersons. That's the other new thing in this canon, is laypersons who are in some kind of ecclesiastical office or important function within the church, if they commit this delict of sexual abuse of, of minors, can also be penalized with some of these same ones. And some of the penalties are, for example, being prohibited from residing in a certain place or having to reside in a certain place. Uh, so my question there would be, uh, it would be pretty hard to impose that on laypersons who might have a, a home and a family. It can also be hard on religious. Um, so some of these penalties are, that are listed here are, are going to be, some will be easier to apply and some difficult. So for religious now, it's not just that you can be dismissed from your institute, which is separate from this delict and the penalty, but also these other penalties apply. And Sister Bauer, you, you mentioned the term vulnerable adults. That is something new here. Can you explain yeah. what that means? That's a very good question, and canonists are working at describing it. it there is a description of it. Uh, uh, Monsignor would know better than me. Is it in Vos Estes or is it in the Vadi Mecum? And mm -hmm. or it, it's in the body makeum. The body makeum that followed both Estes, and canonists are working at trying to define and describe that. But it would be adults who are not really, in the broad sense, capable of consenting. It can also be adults who are in a vulnerable situation in the sense of authority and being subject to authority. So in religious institute, it would be, for example, the superior in relation to all the other members. All the other members are in a way in a vulnerable situation or a novice director and the novice. Uh, but uh, the scope of that and uh, specific definitions of that uh, we're still working out. And, uh, that's, it's a question that canonists, in fact, at, at one of the upcoming Canon Law Society of America conventions, we're planning on a workshop on that particular question. So it's an issue of power, but at the same time also the individual faculties of the person. Right. So it can be an adult who, who has the full use of reason, but they're in a position of being subject to someone else who's in authority. Right. And in a religious institute, that can be a lot of people. Yes. Monsignor King, last question for you. What do you think this means for the future of the church? There were thousands who left the faith amid the abuse crisis. Do these tougher laws invoke a new era for the church? I would hope that these revisions to canon law uh, demonstrate the ability of the church to be agile in response to her sins and her crimes. Um, it's, it's often said that in canon law there wouldn't be a law against it if somebody hadn't done it. And indeed, that's true. The church evolves, the church learns lessons, and sometimes they're very painful lessons. But I believe that this evolution in our law is the result of that and hopefully will instill more confidence in church leadership. Thank you so much.